Howdy folks, today we're gonna to go ahead and talk about our pulmonary system. So we're gonna be talking about breathing, we're gonna talk about the different lung volumes, we're gonna talk about how we're gonna get the gases into the blood and vice versa, how it's gonna be transported then around the body and where we're getting gas exchange. So like all these other presentations, obviously start them over, go over different spots and then leave comments, questions at the end if you have anything of things you'd like me to go into further. Now, really our respiratory system is all about trying to get oxygen to the tissues that need it and remove carbon dioxide from the tissues that are producing it. So turns out our body really likes aerobic metabolism. It is what we're doing chiefly all of the time unless we're doing high intensity exercise. And if we're doing anaerobic for too long, not only does it really hurt, but our performance is going to go down. Now, we have four different processes. We have ventilation, so that's the actual breathing in and out. We have diffusion, which is the gas that's going across from arterioles into the capillaries and then oxygen to the red blood cells and so on. We've got the transport then through the blood, thanks to the pumping action cardiac output, which we covered before. And then we're gonna go ahead and have that capillary diffusion where we're gonna get that gas exchange now at the muscle or other tissue that needs it. So what we have on the right is a spirometer. Now there's a spirometer lab that you can see uh, myself do a couple different iterations, but basically what we're able to do is when you exhale, you're gonna be putting air into the wonderful spirometer vessel that now there's more air in there it's going to rise up which in turn is going to move this pin so we're going to see how much air is inside and we're going to be able to see obviously how much that you either exhaled in the case of what we have nicer versions are going to say inhale and exhale but effectively our normal breathing is what's known as tidal volume i think waves coming in and out now we then have is what's known as our vital capacity and this is the greatest biggest breath in so inspiratory reserve volume exhaling all the way out expiratory reserve volume until we've got literally only what's left is residual volume. That's the air that's naturally in our trachea, in our bronchi, in our bronchioles that just can't deflate that much. So there's always gonna be a little bit of air there. That's sometimes referred to as kind of anatomic dead space. Now we have our functional residual capacity, which is how much we have left over. And then when we put together the residual volume and the vital capacity, we now have our total lung capacity. So how many liters we're able to take in and give out if we were able to like suck out all of the air inside of you, which would be real bad for your health. Now, the lungs themselves are going to be suspended into what's known as pleural sacs. And inside of those, that's where we're gonna have all those individual alveoli. The lungs themselves are taking shape inside of our rib cage. And it turns out they're going to follow the same size and shape. So when we inhale and our rib cage expands, they're going to expand. When we exhale and they're gonna come in, we're going to go ahead and decrease the size. Now, the visceral, the pleural, attaches to the inside lining of our rib cage. If that's disconnected, that's referred to as a collapsed lung, and that's uh, super painful from what I've heard and not a good thing to have. Now, the way that we breathe in now is through pressure gradients. When we breathe in, we're creating a vacuum and negative pressure inside of our chest that's pulling in the ambient air. When we exhale, we're actually creating greater pressure inside of our lungs, which is now pushing that air out. And the first bit of that air that we're breathing in, breathing out, is actually the air that was in our mouth, our nose, our larynx, our trachea, bronchi, bronchioles. It was air that we never even got to use. So it's problematic. So hence, wearing a little extra mask because you're trying to be a decent human being, it turns out that's not gonna be that difficult for you to breathe a little bit more. And wearing a snorkel, like you would do if you were swimming, is another natural extension of this but we're living through interesting times as I'm recording this over the summer of 2020. Now, breathing in is an active process. Our diaphragm, which is the major muscle, it's the one at the bottom that pulls our lungs down, is going to be the one that allows us to breathe in, along with our external intercostals. These are the external muscles in between our ribs. Our internal intercostals are gonna help us breathe out. So the external pull the ribs out, internal bring the ribs in. Now, when we expand both up out and down, we're going to be able to breathe in more air. And you can see those pressure gradients we have in atmospheric pressure, intrapulmonic, which is pressure inside of the lungs, intrapleural, which is the pressure on the pleura. And notice that's always gonna be lower because we want the two, the pleura, to be up against each other. And it's going to move as we breathe in and out. Now, what we're gonna find as we increase that lung volume, we have now lower pressure because we have the same amount of air molecules we started. So we create that vacuum, which is now gonna be pulling air into the lungs which in turn is going to allow it to come in passively thanks to that pressure gradient. And we're going to be able to do even greater breathing in if we're starting to incorporate our scalenes, which means muscles of our neck, along with our sternoclavoid mastoid. 
and we can even use our pectorals. That's when we're kind of have our hands over or hunched down. We're going to use those to help lift up and open up the rib cage. And that's going to allow us to take in even deeper breaths. And that's what you're going to see typically when people are training and working hard. Now, we're going to see on the other side, we have expiration. It's usually this is passive. We literally just relax the diaphragm, diaphragm comes up. It's going to create that greater pressure inside. It's going to go ahead and push the air out. Now we can do this even greater, so you've blown up a balloon, now using those internal, external, or those internal intercostals, apologize guys, along with we can use our lat, our QL, quadratus lumborum, which is in our low back, and we can even use our abs. We're really trying to crunch over to get that last little bit out. You're gonna see that in the spirometry lab that I was working, trying to get the last little bit of lung, or air out of my lungs. Now, we're going to find that this type of respiratory pump of increasing and decreasing the pressure in your chest is actually going to literally help with returning blood flow to the heart. So as our exercise output's going up, we're breathing harder, we're actually now increasing pressure, lowering pressure, which is literally putting pressure on the veins and then letting them fill. Pressure on the veins, letting them fill, which is gonna really help get more blood back to that right atria. So it's gonna be able to fill that right ventricle a little bit more, pump it around the lungs, bada bing, bada boom, we can get it more along to the body in general. Now, at rest, turns out every liter of blood that the heart's pumping, goes to the lungs. So the lungs are gonna have about four to six liters of blood rushing around them every single minute. Now, our amount of blood we're pumping out of our right ventricle is gonna be the exact same amount of blood we're pumping out of our left ventricle, but the reason the right ventricle is so much lower is because the pressure going into your lungs is so much lower than the pressure going into your aorta and then the rest of the body. Because the right ventricle just has to pump it to the lungs and back. The left ventricle has to pump it all the way to your big toe, all the way to the top of your head, all the way to the end of your fingers and back. So that's going to require a lot more pressure production. So we're also going to find that it's going to be a much lower resistance that occurs because we're talking about thinner vessel walls because we don't have to, once again, start with as much pressure to get the blood to go as far. But it is important to understand that we still need to be mindful of the amount of pressure in this area. If we go too far, we can have some issues. And there are some types of cardiovascular diseases that do occur with increased pressure going through the uh, pulmonary system, and that is quite bad. Now, our gases are going to diffuse into our bloodstream based upon their pressures, okay? So, of the air we're all breathing right now, 79.04% of that is nitrogen, 20.93% is oxygen, and about 0.03% is carbon dioxide, and it's going up a little bit all the time, which is on the whole not good, uh, scientifically speaking, uh, based upon consensus, but you know, that's just science and you know, what I base my life on. Now, what we're going to find is that total air pressure is going to be equal to the individual partial pressures when we add them all together, and that's what's known as Dalton's Law. So if we take the normal air pressure, which is about 760 millimeters mercury, it's gonna be higher when there's a high pressure fund, uh, front coming through, lower when there's a low pressure uh, front coming through, that's going to mean we've got about 600.7 millimeters mercury pressure of nitrogen, 159.1 millimeters mercury of oxygen, and about 0.2 millimeters mercury of carbon dioxide. Now, this pressure gradient is, once again, always going to be based upon the fraction that air occupies. So when people say like, it's harder to breathe because you're up at altitude, that's wrong. You actually have less air pressure. So technically there's less pressure to breathe against. So it's actually easier. The problem is the partial pressure of oxygen goes down. So you literally get less oxygen diffusing through the lungs through this concentration gradient than you did when you were at sea level. That's the issue when you're training, when you're at altitude. It's not wearing the Bane mask or wearing one of these things like, yes, you have a little bit more resistance to breathing, but you're gonna be fine. Yeah, you might have a slight decrease in performance, but you do get to look pretty sweet because you're wearing a mask, and that's what bandits wear, right? Okay, now, notice we have a picture on the bottom where we're seeing those sacs that are ending in those individual alveoli, where we're gonna have that really thin wall between the alveoli and our capillaries, where the red blood cells are gonna be at, where we're going to now get this gas exchange. And from there, it's gonna be able to be pumped throughout the body. Now. Gases are always going to diffuse in fluids based upon their partial pressure. So higher pressures are going to push more of a gas into solution than lower pressures. Now, this partial pressure gradient is really, really important because that's explaining to us how much oxygen, how much carbon dioxide, and other gases we're going to be able to get into our bloodstream thanks to those air pressures. Now, when we look at the bottom of the table 7.1, you can see the partial pressure of 
different components of air. And then notice how water, so kind of the air water vapor, goes up massively in your alveoli. Your lungs are naturally very moist. And that's what you can naturally see when it's really cold outside, you can see your breath because you're literally giving off a little bit of fluid each time. And so we're going to find that, notice we have that initial partial pressure of oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and then all of a sudden they change. That's because A, we also have carbon dioxide that's being given off consistently. So that's occupying a greater percentage because of what we're breathing. And we're going to have a greater amount of water in the air. So now the oxygen gradient is decreasing massively. So the atmospheric pressure is about 159 millimeter mercury and partial pressure of oxygen. Now that goes down to about 105, thanks to once again the CO2 and carbon dioxide, and sorry, CO2 and H2O water components that are changing. Now the alveolar air then goes down to the actual oxygen saturation in the blood, which is usually about 100 millimeters of mercury per liter. Now that in turn is going to then be taken up at the tissues it goes to so that whenever you get it returning from the right ventricle into the lungs to, because it's deoxygenated blood, on average, that's only gonna have about 40 millimeters mercury because some of the tissues that the blood went through or the blood went to is going to take out all of the oxygen. So like hardworking muscles can pretty much extract every last little oxygen molecule it can. Whereas other parts are gonna to go to say things like your digestive tract, they're not really using many calories at that point, they're not using a lot of oxygen, so they're not going to have the same type of energetic turnover. Now, we then have what's known as Fick's Law, which is how fast we diffuse these gases is gonna be related to the surface area we're using and then how great the gradient is. Now, we're going to find that the greater the amount of area we have, the thinner that this gradient goes across and the greater pressure gradients, the more amount of gas we need to go across. Now, CO2 is gonna diffuse a lot faster than oxygen just because of properties of the molecule compared to oxygen. So don't worry about that when it says CO2 diffuses faster, that's just the natural way that it moves compared to oxygen, just molecular differences. Now, what we're going to see is that our body is naturally really trying to optimize for this because we have these really, really thin membranes. We've got this huge amount of surface area because we have all these millions on millions of alveoli as opposed to just having like two big balloons that would increase and decrease in size that wouldn't give us as much surface area. So our diffusion capacity is going to be related to obviously how much oxygen we're gonna be able to go ahead and get across these gradients. Now we're gonna find once we go ahead and work our way up in exercise, we're going to use even more oxygen in those tissues because now we're putting more blood towards those tissues that matter. And we're going to do a much better job of, since we're depleting it, we've created a bigger gradient. So we're gonna be able to pick up even more capacity of oxygen compared to what we're doing at rest, simply because we're depleting it, creating a bigger gradient. So another thing that's important to keep in mind is when you are at rest, the way your blood is actually being circulated through your lungs because the top third of your lungs is literally higher than the middle third, which is in turn higher than the lower third. Gravity is naturally pulling more blood towards the lower third of your lung than the midpoint of your lung and the, or the midsection of your lung and the highest section of your lung. So because of that, we're not actually getting as much blood flow to the area and we're not gonna get as much, get as good of gas exchange. As we increase exercise, we also increase systolic blood pressure. So we're pumping with more force. So now we're fully perfusing that mid segment and that upper segment of the lung. So we're getting much better gas exchange across the entirety of the lung. Now, we're gonna see that we're gonna carry about 20 milliliters of oxygen for every milliliter of blood we have, which then equates out to one liter of oxygen and five liters of blood, which is about how much your average person has total. And most of this is gonna be bound up to our hemoglobin, okay? And when we put oxygen on hemoglobin, we now have what's known as oxyhemoglobin. Yay, without it, it's deoxyhemoglobin. D without oxy, oxygen, hemoglobin. And a small percentage of it is going to be dissolved in our plasma. Now, what we're going to then have is there's an affinity. So hemoglobin doesn't just always bind as hard as it can, it's going to bind at different strengths depending on the availability of oxygen. So what it's going to do is the higher amounts of oxygen available, the, or the looser it's gonna effectively grab. So notice we go to the top and then we're gonna bring ourselves down relatively rapidly, even when we're slightly decreasing the pressure. And then finally we have that precipitous drop at the end. Now this is good because what this means is we're gonna pick up 
oxygen pretty well and hold on to it loosely whenever we get it from the lungs. But the second we come to tissues that have lower amount of oxygen in them, aka our working muscles and our tissues that are metabolically active, we're going to unload it pretty quickly. Okay, this is what's known as a saturation curve. Now, this saturation curve can be changed based upon pH and temperature. As the temperature of the blood increases, it is going to much more rapidly let go of oxygen. It's not going to bind it or hold it as well or hold it strong. And the same is true as the pH goes down, it's the same thing, not going to hold it on, hold on to it as strong. Now, why do you think that when the temperature goes up, and the pH goes down, it tends to let go of oxygen a lot more easily than you think. Go ahead and pause the video, think it over. Now, since I know most of you didn't pause it, let's talk about it. Well, that's because exercising muscle is warmer than the rest of the body, so that's that increased temperature, so we're much more rapidly gonna let go of oxygen. And the second part is exercising muscle that's anaerobic is going to be dropping the local pH, so it is definitely going to release oxygen even faster. This is a natural advantage because it's going to allow us to dissociate when we don't need it and hold on to it when we do. Now, based upon how much hemoglobin we have, how much blood we have, we can literally only hold so much oxygen per 100 milliliters of blood. So once we go ahead and try, we can't really go above that. If anything, we can actually have a lower amount of saturation because when we're exercising, we're sending blood through the lungs even faster and it just doesn't have as much time to fully saturate. So how much oxygen we carry in the blood depends very heavily on our hemoglobin content. If we have a high amount of hemoglobin, we can hold more oxygen. Now, obviously, too high of hemoglobin equals too high of what's known as hematocrit, which is essentially the viscosity of the blood, and your heart doesn't like to pump maple syrup. And then the other side is true is if we have too low of hemoglobin, now we have things like anemia, where people are anemic, where they're not going to have as many red blood cells as they need, and their aerobic performance and just athletic performance is going to tank in general. And that sometimes is caused by nutritional reasons, sometimes it's caused by injury or illness, but it's important to understand that hemoglobin is that major protein that oxygen prefers to bind to, to get it into the bloodstream, and if we don't have enough of it, we're not gonna be able to carry it that well. Now, carbon dioxide is being produced by those cells that are using aerobic metabolism. It's gonna be carried away actually in three different ways. So it's not just carried as carbon dioxide, it's mostly being carried as bicarbonate ion. Uh, ions, and some of it is actually going to bind to hemoglobin to form what's known as carboaminohemoglobin. Now, let's go ahead and talk about bicarbonate first. 67% of this is how the carbon dioxide is going to go. First, carbon dioxide interacts with water to form carbonic acid. This, in turn, which is catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase inside of our red blood cells, is going to then dissociate into bicarbonate which is where you see, if we look at the chemical flow chart across, where we have that bicarbonate plus a proton. So it does give us a little bit of a buffering effect because we have the H plus and we have the bicarbonate. And so from here, it's gonna go from the red blood cells into the bloodstream. Now, carbon dioxide itself, the true gas dissolved in plasma is gonna be about seven to 10% of the CO2 that you have in your body. Now. It's going to then be, when it's lower in the lungs, it's going to diffuse out of the solution and then go into our alveoli, so we're going to breathe it off. And that's why we see that high resting amount of carbon dioxide, because we're constantly trying to get rid of it. And then finally, we have carbino, yeah, carbamino hemoglobin, which is about one-fifth to one-third of how carbon dioxide is going to be transported. Bound up to hemoglobin, it does not bind in the same spot as oxygen, okay? It binds to another component of it. And then same situation, when we have the lower pressure, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, it's gonna dissociate faster, aka once we get it to the lungs, we can get rid of it at a much higher rate. Now, the amount of oxygen we're able to actually take up on a liter of blood by liter of blood basis is what's known as our arterial venous oxygen difference, AVO2 difference. The bigger the AVO2 difference, the greater amount of oxygen we're gonna unload. So if we have 20 milliliters of oxygen, we look at A up there, coming out of the, in the blood when we're in the artery, and then when we measure it again in the vein, it's at 15 to 16 milliliters. We know we just managed to diffuse off four to five milliliters of oxygen. And so if we can do a better job of picking it up, we're going to see obviously a lower amount of oxygen in the veins because we use it in the capillaries. This is good because that means the tissues are getting what they need and they're going to be able to use it. The problem with it is this is very much so dependent on the tissues it's going to. 
And that's why it's really important that we do a really good job of vasodilating to the tissues that need blood and we vasoconstrict to the tissues that don't, don't need blood when we rest. So that way we can go ahead and match those energy demands, match those activity demands, and make sure that we're able to maintain our performance, preferably aerobically, because it turns out that's going to be a lot more comfortable than having to use a lot of anaerobic metabolism. Now, how do we get into the muscle? Well, in the muscle, we have a specific type of protein that's going to hold on oxygen called myoglobin. Myoglobin has a much higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin. If you look at the graph on the right, this is good because it's gonna pull that oxygen off of the hemoglobin out of the capillaries and bring it to the mitochondria in your cell. Because pretty much as soon as you get that oxygen into your mitochondria of your cell, you're not really storing it up. Oxygen is a relatively dangerous molecule. You don't wanna have it hanging around any longer than you need it. So it pretty much goes into the black hole that is your electron transport chain inside your mitochondria, where it's eventually going to be turned into water. And from there, you're going to go ahead and use it for energy production and so on and so forth. So notice how we have to wait a while before we're gonna really see a rapid desaturation of oxygen from myoglobin as opposed to hemoglobin. Because once again, it's used to dealing with that range that's gonna be relatively low. So we're going to see the amount of oxygen we have inside of our circulatory system is going to be essentially that partial pressure of oxygen or our saturation of our hemoglobin. This is gonna give us that gradient for the exchange. And so we find if we're increasing blood flow, we're going to be increasing oxygen delivery, decreasing blood flow, decreasing oxygen delivery. And this is natural. If you guys maybe had a big meal and try to work out, you're now delivering far less oxygen to your tissues of your digestive system. So you can cramp up, feel really uncomfortable. Whereas if you're maintaining a really good blood flow to all those tissues, you're not gonna have that issue. You're gonna be comfortable, you're gonna be able to go. And remember how pH and temperature are both going to be influencing hemoglobin to let go of oxygen when we're at that higher temperature, lower pH that we're getting around muscle, and then picking it up a lot faster where we're gonna have the higher pH and lower temperature when we get to the lungs. So carbon dioxide is really effectively just lose, uh, moving through simple diffusion. And it's gonna be very much so all about the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is what's creating that gradient. So the lower the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, specifically once we get to the lungs and giving off, the faster we're gonna be able to get rid of it. And then how do we regulate this? Well, it turns out the body wants to make sure that you already have an, always have enough oxygen, carbon dioxide, and you're controlling your, your pH. So we've got a number of receptors inside of our muscles, inside of our nervous system that are letting us know when we have too much carbon dioxide, too much pH, and too low of oxygen, which in turn is going to be then interpreted by our nervous system, which is going to then cause our breathing rate to increase if it needs to, so that we're gonna be able to keep up our performance. And at the same time, we're also getting information to make sure we don't overstretch the lungs, breathe in too much, or we might damage it. This is where maybe if you guys have ever been riding on like a motorcycle, suck your head out of the wheel of a car when you're going really fast, and it's like it's almost uncomfortable to try to breathe when the air is going in your face, because that's the stress, stretch sen uh, sensors feeling like you might overstretch your lungs, and it turns out if you blow a lung, that's really bad. So the body wants to go ahead and refrain from doing so. And so same thing, if we have that overstretch, then we're gonna go ahead and try to push the air out of the lungs. And the body's constantly gonna go ahead and try to regulate to make sure that you're breathing in, inspiration and expiration as quickly as you need to in order to get yourself to do it. And most of it's involuntary. Until I tell you to think about your breath, you're probably not. Your body's just kind of doing its own thing, breathing at its own rate, running its own race. But this is one of those lower brain functions. So now we're talking about pons, medulla oblongata, otherwise, that are maintaining this to keep us alive. So this is just going further into the same thing that I just said. Notice the cortex overrides it, aka you can tell yourself to quit breathing. You can tell yourself to breathe faster. You can tell yourself to breathe slower. I thoroughly suggest some of you guys look at some of the more interesting things these days, like box breathing uh, as a way to calm yourself down. You can look at Wim Hof and some of his work when it comes to kind of tapping into the nervous systems to help you uh, either get a little bit up for it or more relaxed in order so that you're going to be able to regulate your body. Now we're sort of also kind of playing around a little bit of, with our autonomic nervous system. And then how we're going to change uh, the amount of different partial pressures. And that's going to be giving based upon that information. Of, notice it's mostly based on carbon dioxide. So we spend a lot of time taking deep breaths. We're going to really lower that partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And you can hold your breath for an incredibly long period of time. 
However, you can risk things like blackouts, which is real bad, especially if you're doing this while you're, oh, I don't know, doing diving in the ocean. Science. So we are going to have those chemoreceptors that are going to be in our aorta, in our carotid, which is telling us, hey, do we have enough oxygen, enough carbon dioxide, enough, or is the H proton level too high? What's fun is whenever our pH goes down too low because our hydrogen ions are too high, our brain thinks we're poisoned. So it's what it literally forces us to do is throw up, which I'm sure some of you guys have crossed that line or felt really nauseous from hard exercise, Lord knows I have. That's because of all of those protons are telling our brain we're poisoned. Our body's like, well, let's just empty the stomach. Your stomach is very acidic in the first place. So that's another way that after you vomit, you're gonna be pulling a lot of those protons from the bloodstream into the stomach so that you're now gonna be bringing your pH back up because of moving those hydrogen ions. Science is crazy. So. Thank you guys for listening. Have yourselves a great day. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, leave them below or please contact me by email. All right, guys, stay safe out there and talk with you more soon. Bye-bye.